Again, I am super excited. If you are new here, again, my name is Janae Waller or Prophetess Janae Waller. I'm excited about this series teaching. It's just been something the Lord has placed on my heart. Um, just what we need to know and what we need to be able to obtain to become these these dynamic and powerful people here on the earth as ambassadors of Christ. So super excited again. I cannot stop saying that because I am. Although it's been a very long week, I am so glad to be before you guys today. I'm so thankful for you all being here. Don't take this time lightly. I know you have many other things you could be doing right now. So I just praise the Lord for each of you. Again, this is part two of the spiritual authority teaching. We're going to go into accessing spiritual authority tonight. Accessing spiritual authority. I do encourage you to take notes. I do want to first just state that when we talk about accessing spiritual authority, we must also have faith in what it is we're wanting God to do. We have to have faith in God. We have to have faith in our Lord and Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, that what we're asking God to do, that he's going to do it. You cannot have faith in something you do not believe in. It's an oxymoron. And that's why there's a difference between Christians and believers, because the, the switch between the two is belief. Christians typically lose the aspect of belief. Christians can sometimes also mean you're lukewarm. You're not really living out this faith walk with Christ. You're not dying to the flesh every day. So again, there is a difference between Christians and believers. So sometimes you may not even hear me say the word Christian. I may say believer, believer, because the Bible talks about the belief being the aspect that is the shift between you just being a hearer of a word, but actually a doer. How can you access your spiritual authority? There's two things that will allow you to obtain or access spiritual authority. The first one would be you first need to be a born again believer. So you have to have received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. According to Romans 10 and 9, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we shall be saved. So you have to be born again believer. The second thing, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says that they received power after the Holy Ghost had come upon them. And we talked about this briefly last week as well. We talked about the power of the Holy Ghost, that those do, that do not have power, those that are not moving in power, they likely do not have the Holy Ghost. It's very plain. It's very simple. I want to go to Matthew 28, 18 through 19. You guys can put that in the chat. Matthew 28, 18 through 19. And Jesus came and said to them all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in my name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Again, we have to become disciples of Jesus Christ. When we become a disciple, we need to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, all authority of heaven and earth have been given to me. So Jesus already has the authority for heaven and for earth. And I'm going to get into how we obtain that authority through Christ Jesus. Of course, one way is the Holy Spirit, but I'm also going to talk about some other things as well. So just hang tight and we're going to really dive deep into accessing spiritual authority. You need to know this. You are not going to be able to walk out a powerful, impactful, a dynamic, um, life-changing or world-changing, even as visionaries, as apostles, as prophets, as evangelists, as teachers, as ministers of the gospel, whatever your mantle is, you won't be able to fully walk that out without the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost, but you also need the power. You need to access the power by way of the Holy Ghost. So we have to become 
some will say weapons, but we have to be able to ignite. We need to be ignited. There needs to be a spark ignited in us as believers because without that spark, you will never be able to walk into what the Lord really wants you to move into, what the Lord really put you here to do as an ambassador of Christ, wherever they may be. That may be in your city. That may be in your state. That may be in the nations. That may be in a whole nother country. That may be in a whole nother demographic, people that don't look like you, people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, but you're going to need the authority of Jesus Christ to do these things. Some things we can't do in our own might. It's not by power. It's not by might, but it's by my spirit, said the Lord. God was very clear that some things you will not be able to do on your own. You're going to need the power of the Holy Ghost to do it. In Philippians 3 and 7, it talks about us being citizens of heaven. If Jesus said that all authority of heaven and earth is given to me, and the Bible also says that we're seated in heavenly places, that means the same access that Jesus had, we have that same access by way of the Holy Ghost. We're not limited to what we can do here in the earth. We actually are co-heirs. We're co-ambassadors. We're co-laborers with Christ Jesus. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that today because you have to understand understand what that means. If you don't know what a co-heir is, if you don't know what a co-ambassador, a co-laborer is, if you don't know what a citizen of heaven is, it's going to be hard for you to access something when you don't know your position. You don't know what you legally have right to by way of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to walk in it until you yet understand it. So in Jesus' name, we're going to just get a little bit deeper in that this evening. So the Holy Spirit comes to give you authority. We've already talked about that. And you can read about that in the book of Acts. I, I encourage you all to take a deep dive into the New Pentecost um, Church and the book of Acts. It's going to really help you understand some of the things that they could not do prior to the Holy Spirit and the things they were able to do and to step into and to walk into once they received the power of the Holy Ghost, once the Holy Ghost fell upon them, once the Holy Ghost came upon them, and once the Holy Ghost just breathed literally on them, there were some things that they were able to do which they were not able to do before, even with Jesus here. Some of those disciples, they were with Jesus, but yet they didn't do those things until he left. So that shows us that God doesn't need to necessarily be literally have Jesus in the flesh do everything. He needs us to access the power of Jesus Christ by way of the Holy Ghost so then we can carry out the same acts, the same greater works that Jesus said that we will do as co-laborers, as ambassadors of Christ in this earth. Hallelujah. So you are a house. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You are a citizen of heaven, so you're in this fleshly body. You're having an earthly experience, but you're a spiritual being first. You're first seated in heaven before you were ever seated in this earth. I hope you heard me. You were seated in heaven before you were seated in earth. So the authority that was given to you in heaven, you obtained that before you obtained any authority over this earth. Hallelujah. Psalms 115, 16 says, the heaven and the earth, excuse me, the heaven and even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has been given to the children of men. I'm going to say that again. The heaven and the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So God has already given you the earth. God has already given us the power and the dominion to walk in this earth. He gave Adam the dominion in the book of Genesis. So that same dominion that Adam had, we have through our salvation. We have that through Christ Jesus. We have that through the Holy Ghost. Amen. And for you to access spiritual authority, of course, we said you needed to be a born again believer. The second thing we said was you needed to have the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you also have to take rulership and inherit your, your rightful place as a son of God. When we talk about son of God, we're not talking about gender. We're actually talking about 
maturity. We're talking about maturity in Christ. We're talking about being a spirit-filled believer. You can read more about this in Romans 8. It breaks down that those, and I talked about this last week, that those that aren't even filled with his spirit, God says they are not his. So you need to be filled with his spirit for him to claim you as his. I know we have salvation. I know we're saved, but he said for you to be his, you need the Holy Ghost. So sons of God is maturity. Sons of God are filled with the Holy Ghost. We receive sonmanship through the Holy Spirit. That is one of the major differences between a Christian and a believer. A believer has sonmanship through or sonship through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. So sons of God, again, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this just to break it down so you understand sons of God. Sons of God refers to the maturation of a child of God. This is not a reference to gender. I said this just a moment ago. But sonship, which is only available to those that have received the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Sonship is not given to those that have only confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's only given to those that have received the Spirit of God. Sonship is not given to those that have only confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's given to those that have received the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Romans 8.14 says, For as many are, are led, ugh, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. So sons of God are led by the Spirit, not by the flesh. They're led by the Spirit, according to Romans 8, 14. Amen. And I talked a little bit about this um, a little while ago, but I was talking about being heirs of God, being joint heirs with Christ. You can read about that in Romans 8 and 17 and 8 and, 8 and 19. So Romans 8, 17, you can read about being joint heirs with Christ and heirs of God. And that's also in Romans 8, 19. I'm not going to go too deep in that, but that just means that the same thing that Jesus has access to, we have access to. Joint heirs inherit the same things that their parents have. A joint heir, if, you're, if your parent was a king of a kingdom, that would make you a prince one day. You would, you're going to be prince, but then you would take the place of the king one day of course we know we don't replace jesus we know that but we are joint heirs so that means whatever he has we have whatever he could do we could do in jesus name amen through the holy spirit so i want you to understand that you have been predestined each of you if you're listening to me you've been predestined you've been called you've been justified and you've been glorified and you can read about that again in Romans 8, 29 through 30. I don't have my Bible with me because I got a whole little setup right here. But predestined means predetermined, decided beforehand, appointed beforehand. So before you even got in this earth, before you was even born, God predestined you. So he predetermined you. He decided beforehand and he appointed you beforehand. It's almost like you didn't even have a choice because God said you were going to be chosen. You were going to be called. Amen. Just to go a little bit deeper into the definition of predestined, this is the Greek definition. It means to be called, to name, to bear a name or title among men. I'm going to say that again. Predestined means to be called. To name, to bear a name or title among men. So you are already called. You already hold a title in this land. Even if the world doesn't know it, God has already given you the title through Christ Jesus by way of the Holy Ghost. Also, I want to talk about justified. It also says to be justified. This is the second definition, actually. Justified to declare, pronounce, want to be just righteous 
God has already pronounced you. He's already declared. The Bible says if we would decree, declare a thing, it would be established unto us in life. His favor would shine upon our path. So that means that God has already declared who you are to him. He's already declared who you are through Christ Jesus. You don't have to sit and tussle with people and go back and forth with them. Well, they said I'm not this. And they said, who does God say you are at the end of the day? It doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter. If you took away, if you took away the earthly title from me, it does not change who I am to him. If you took away the title and the accolades and all the um, different accomplishment, it does not change who I am in Christ Jesus. If you took away the title on a piece of paper, if you tried to defame me, if you tried to ruin my reputation, it would not matter because I'm already a joint heir with him. I, I'm already a co-laborer with him. I'm already an ambassador of Christ here on the earth. I'm already seated in heavenly places. It does not matter. You can take anything. But you cannot take who God has already predetermined, who God has already predestined, who God has already pre-established, who God has already predetermined who I would be, who you would be. You can't take that from me. They can't take that from you when you know who you are. No man walking the face of this earth, no demon, no witch, no warlock, no devil in hell can take away your authority. In Jesus' name, it's already been pronounced. It's already been predetermined. It was already predestined. Before the foundations of the earth, he established it. That means before Genesis 1, it was already established. Before Genesis 1, it was already predetermined who you were going to be. Before he formed the world, it was already predetermined who you were going to be. Hallelujah. It's also another definition, again, this is the Greek definition of predestined, to render righteous, to show, exhibit, advice, one, to be righteous. God has already said, he's already put you out to the world as his. He's already marked you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I also want to talk about glorify because... Um, if you go read Romans 8, 29 through 30, these are all words that are in there. And I just st studied some of those words and glorified, again, Greek definition, to praise, exalt, magnify, elaborate, honor, hold in honor, to make glorious, adore with luster, clothe with splendor. This is how God thinks of you. This is how God sees you. He sees you magnified. He sees you hold in honor. He sees you to be made glorious, adored with his luster, clothed with his splendor. Hallelujah. So how much more do you need to think of yourself? Don't let people think that you have to hold Rebbe Shia. That humility means you need to be talking down on yourself. That humility means you need to be less than. No, the Bible says you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are the lender and not the borrower. So how dare I come down to a mediocre level of someone else's thinking just to appease to whatever projections, to whatever insecurities, to whatever thing they got going on internally because they don't know who they are. We don't come down to that level when we know who we are. We don't lower ourselves to make other people comfortable. It is time for children of God to stop dumbing down their selves to fit into society, to fit into a world, that a world that knows why are they even trying to fit in with me? But ain't they a child of God? Why are they trying to fit in with me? But they supposed to be the peculiar people. Why are they trying to fit in with me when they supposed to be the salt of the earth? Why are they trying to fit in with me? When they're the one that's seated in heavenly places, why are they trying to fit in with me? When they're the children of the Most High God. Because these are things that we say out of our mouth, so other people start to pick up on it. So I don't understand. If their God is so good, if their God is so so magnified, so glorious, why are they trying to be a part of what we got going on? Why, as children of God, we don't have flocks following us just as Jesus did. 
I'm going to tell you why. Because people don't follow people that don't know who they are. Nobody's going to follow you when you don't know who you are. You could be on this social media platform on YouTube or TikTok doing the silliest things. But if you're sure of what you're doing, if you look like you know what you're doing, people don't follow you. You don't get millions of views. You don't get thousands of views. But nobody follows an uncertain person. Nobody follows a person that's timid. A person that's not assured of what they're doing, of who they are. Even if you don't feel like you really know what you're doing. If you could project to other people that you know what you're doing, people will listen to you. People will talk, will sit and watch your content or whatever you want to call it. Children of God need to begin not only to walk in the authority but to also teach other people, this is why I'm here. I'm not here for my own liking. I'm here because I, again, don't want to be the only person that I know that has the access to this and is doing it in my city, is doing it in the nations, is doing it when I get on TikTok and um, on YouTube. It's healing, healing people, delivering people, setting people free. Miracles are happening. But yet nobody around me is doing it. My job is to lead. My assignment is to build you up. My assignment is to equip you. My assignment is to train you not to be just as good, but to be better than me. A great leader will build you to surpass them. I'm here to build you to surpass me. And I haven't even reached my height in the name of Jesus. But I'm still here to build you, to surpass me. Everything I know, everything the Holy Ghost has taught me, everything I've learned through other mentorships I've taken from great men of God, I'm going to teach you. We have to be taught. We have to be equipped because the world has a way of putting out what they want us to know, what they want us to accept, what they want our children to accept, what they say that our children would be. The devil is a liar. It is time to rise up. It is time to stop being um, back in the backlight. Well, somebody else is going to do it. No, God chose you. It's not a somebody else thing. It's a you thing. You can put that in the chat. It's not a somebody else thing. It's a you thing. It's your assignment. It's your assignment. Somebody can say that. It's my assignment. It's my assignment. It's not about knowing everything. That's why you have the Holy Ghost. He's your teacher. You don't have to know everything. You just need to be available and willing to be used. That is it. God is looking for availability and he's looking for willingness. God is looking for available people and willingness. He said, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. God wants to make you renowned. That's another definition for glorified. But not renowned for the things that you necessarily did, but the things you did through him, for him, and for his glory. Amen. Glorify, another definition, to cause the dignity and worth of some person or thing to become manifested and acknowledged. This is biblical definition. This is not Webster, y'all. Listen to me. Glorify to cause the dignity and worth of some person or something to become manifested and acknowledged. God wants to glorify you to the point where other people look at you and they acknowledge who you are. They don't have a choice but to acknowledge you because the glory that rests on your life, it shows, it exudes. Because of the glory that precedes you, it, it shows, it exudes. They have no choice. You cannot you cannot ignore something that is prevalent. You cannot ignore something that's right in front of your face, even if you wanted to, because that is just how much God is going to use and wants to use us. That it will cannot be less lessened down. It cannot be, well, I, she say God with her. No, you're going to know in this season. People are going to know that you're a chosen one by God. People will know that you have and walk in the authority and you know who you are in Christ Jesus. Because it's going to be manifested. So once it's manifest, they must acknowledge it. 
You don't have to necessarily say it. You just have to do what God told you to do. And people will have to acknowledge who you are. Not only in the earth, but who you are to God. You don't have to say, I'm this, I'm that. If y'all ever notice, I don't even have prophetess in my title, on my TikTok, on my YouTube, on my Instagram. I don't have to say I'm a prophet. I tell y'all when y'all get on here, just so you know. But I don't have to have it everywhere. Because people are going to know who you are, whether you have the title on your name or not. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. Oh, Rebbe Shia. So I'm here to tell you the world's going to know you by your fruit. The world is going to know you by your fruit. Whatever fruit you manifest here in the earth, that's what people are going to acknowledge you by. Whether your fruit be good, whether your fruit be bad. That is what people are going to acknowledge you by. I'm not talking about your past fruit. I'm not talking about seasonal fruit. I'm talking about the fruit you 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 continue to reproduce. The fruit you continue to cultivate. Those are the things that people are going to know you by. Amen. Hallelujah. So I say to y'all, because I really want y'all to begin to ask the Lord, Lord, what, am I, what is it that I'm not doing? I'm going to leave y'all with a couple of scriptures, but I'm going to leave you with some pointers as well. And the first question I have for you, who is waiting for you? You can go look in Romans 8, 19 through uh, 21. You also can look in Romans 23, but I believe it's in Romans 8 and 29, the Bible says that all creation eagerly waits for the sons of God to be revealed. So I ask you, who is waiting for you? Who is waiting for you? Who is waiting for you? I'm going to tell you the first answer. Creation is waiting for you. According to Romans 8, 19 through 21, the second thing that's waiting for you, is you. According to Romans 8, 23, I'm going to go to that scripture for y'all. Creation is waiting for you and you are waiting for you. I know that can be hard to receive, but there's a part of you that is waiting for you to get to the place that God already predestined for you to be because it was implanted in you before you were formed in your mother's womb. It was already predestined that you would be there. Your spirit almost has already experienced it because everything happens in the spirit first. But you have to catch up this flesh to where your spirit is already yearning to be. Where your spirit has already experienced it. You have to catch the flesh up to that. Amen. So Romans 8 and 19. For the earnest, so Romans 8, we starting at 19. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So that was first one, the first one. I said creation was waiting for you. For the creation was subject to frutality, not willing, but because of him who is subject, it in hope. 21. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, so, excuse me, together until now. Not only that, verse 23, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adaptation or adoption, the redemption of our body. I just answered the question for y'all. Remember I said the second part of who was waiting for you was you. I'm going to read that again. Verse 23, 823. Romans 823. Not only that, but we also... Mm -hmm.